Well, welcome again to another uh, version of the Educational Technology Advisory Committee uh, Town Hall Meeting Series. Uh, I'm Joe Moreau, I'm the Vice Chancellor of Technology for the Foothill Beyond District. Uh, and today our topic is an update, uh, status report on the California Community College Online Education Initiative, or OEI as we call it. Uh, I'm uh, joined this afternoon by my good friends and colleagues, uh, Pat James, who is the OEI Executive Director and uh, leads the initiative for the state, and uh, our good friend and colleague, Jamie Johnson, who is our uh, Director of Accessibility and User Experience and uh, oversees a lot of the uh, uh, accessibility uh, compliance and universal design issues related to the products and services that we provide for students and faculty. So um, with that, uh, we'll jump right in because we have a lot to cover today. There's a lot going on in the OEI world and it's all really pretty cool stuff that I think people will be very excited about. Um, uh, let's see, come on, screech, there we go. Uh, this is, uh, I'm running this, uh, this presentation off of our uh, Office 365 uh, program today that uh, we launched uh, last December and we've got quite a few people using that. Uh, so I'm using the PowerPoint Lite version. Uh, additional topics for ETEC Town Hall program uh, this year will include uh, next month an update on information security awareness. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what we're gonna do in May. Um, and so if anybody has any suggestions, uh, please feel free to email me or any of the members of ETAC, and you can find that uh, ETAC roster on the uh, ETS website. Um, my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, Marty Kahn, who is our, uh, our media support for uh, today's uh, meeting, and. Uh, he does a, a terrific job of making sure that all these ETEC town hall recordings get uh, uh, indexed and captioned and posted on the district YouTube channel. Ask me to remind anyone who joins us today that uh, you may be uh, included uh, in our uh, YouTube recording if you're logging into Zoom and participating. So um, off we go. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, uh, say quickly about a, a, a little bit about what what is the CCC OEI uh, if if you haven't been following this uh, since uh, uh, late 2013 uh, this is a statewide initiative that the uh, the governor proposed uh, to provide better support for online programs at all 113 colleges and it's led by uh, jointly by the uh, uh, our district and the uh, Butte uh, Glen Community College District uh, on behalf of uh, all 113 colleges. Uh, the initial funding for the uh, program was uh, designated at uh, $57 million for the first five years. That started, year one started in December of 2013, and uh, we received $16.9 million for year one, and with an ongoing funding stream of uh, $10 million annually uh, starting in year two. Uh, that funding is considered permanent. Uh, as much as any funding in the California Community Colleges is permanent, that is permanent. So uh, even though there'll be a, a program a grant a renewal process at the, at the five-year mark, uh, that funding will continue. Um, the governor and the legislature really asked us to do a number of very basic things with this program. But in general, it's designated or designed to help improve student success in online courses and programs. Uh, and so first and foremost, the governor had asked us to uh, do what we can in with online courses and programs to help students with degree completion focused on the associate degree for transfer. Um, and because he's uh, really uh, trying to address the needs of, of uh, employers throughout the state who have said, you know, we need more degreed individuals in the state in order to grow the economy, grow the tax base, grow our businesses. Uh, and so the more people you can get to graduate with a bachelor's degree, the better. And of course, uh, from the community colleges, the most effective path is often uh, the associate degree for transfer for students. So that's a big focus of ours. Um, we were also asked to, to generally look at improving student retention and success in online courses. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but it, it's been no secret that uh, for a long time, uh, retention and success uh, 
uh, student retention success in online courses has been su su substantially lower than, than in face-to-face -face courses. Uh, and so we're really trying to, to bring that up. Uh, also specifically, we were asked to uh, address the achievement gap among student demographic groups in online courses. We also know that uh, students uh, of uh, uh, African-American students or Latino students often do uh, have retention and success rates even lower than uh, white and uh, Asian, uh, Asian American students do in online courses. And so we want to try to close that achievement gap for all demographic groups. And then finally, we're really asked to leverage the size uh, and influence of, of the California Community College as being the largest system of higher education on the planet to improve online program effectiveness. And we'll, we'll, you'll see a lot of the ways that, that we're doing that uh, already with uh, the advancements uh, or the accomplishments of OEI. Uh, so with that, I, I wanted to just share a, a couple of notes about project governance. Uh, how is this project led? How, who operates it? And, and there's a couple of answers to that question. Uh, first and foremost, uh, there is a management team in place, which, which Pat leads for, for us. Uh, we, uh, we have a variety of district staff from both uh, Foothill De Anza and from Butte that make up the management team. Uh, they're spread out all over the state. Uh, on purpose, uh, and um, and they have the day-to-day -day responsibility for uh, managing the project and and, and operating the, the services and products that, that we provide through the product project. Uh, we also have a steering committee. That steering committee is uh, Pat. How many do we have on the steering committee now? Like twenty-seven or twenty-nine or something along those lines. Yeah, we were just going through the list today, and there's probably about twenty-five active right now, and right. So vacancies to fill. Yeah, they're broadly representative of stakeholders statewide. So uh, we have quite a few uh, uh, members from the statewide academic senate. Uh, we have representatives of the chief academic officers, the chief student services officers, uh, the CEOs, uh, all of the folks throughout the state uh, that uh, have uh, a stake in, in what we're working on. Uh, the steering committee is predominantly focused on policy and policy and strategy matters. And they're advisory to the OEI management team. So whenever we have an issue that kind of falls into the policy strategy realm, that's an issue that we take to the steering committee. They weigh in on it uh, and then and come back with a recommendation to the management team. Uh, we also have what we call the consortium. And this is, um, it started with a, a group of pilot colleges that we recruited uh, almost two years ago now. Um, and currently, uh, that's about 24 college. It is 24 colleges, and so there are, there are two representatives from each college that serve on the consortium board. Uh, the consortium really is operationally focused, uh, so they work with us to figure out. Okay, so we're we're the, these are the policies and the strategies that we're implementing, and how do we really actually make that happen uh, on a kind of a boots on the ground uh, in the instructional trenches perspective. Uh, that group uh, is is formalized through a memorandum of understanding, so they've all signed on formally uh, to participate, and it has a charter and rules of engagement um, for how we'll interact with each other. And then finally, uh, both the steering committee and the consortium also uh, employ work groups, or what, what, what we might call a task force. Uh, these are groups that usually come together uh, around a specific project component, for example, when we were in the process of choosing, uh, developing the specifications for a common course management system, we brought together the common course management system work group, and they helped us really uh, create those specifications. Once that was done, they kind of, and we chose the common course management system platform, they kind of ceased to be, and now we have a different group that is kind of overseeing the ongoing development and utilization of, of the Common Course Management System now that's in production. So uh, both the consortium and the steering committee use those work groups as, as needed to bring focused attention onto a specific project component. Uh, so what have we been working on since December of 2013? Well, a lot of really awesome stuff. And, um, and we'll kind of go through it all, sort of in chronological order as to how those things have come online. Uh, but one of the first things that we worked on was course design standards online, for online courses. We'd heard from a lot of faculty that they really didn't have a, any particular place to look for 
design standards that would be uh, applicable to the California Community Colleges and help them uh, really understand how best to design uh, uh, an online course. So uh, we put together a faculty work group uh, in co collaboration with our, our colleagues at the Statewide Academic Senate. Uh, we've reviewed a whole host of existing national standards, things like Quality Matters, um, INACOL, which has uh, uh, been very uh, predominant in the K-12 system. We looked at uh, uh, CSU had developed standards. Uh, Blackboard had also developed standards. We looked at all of those and then kind of took them and customized and combined those national standards to meet the unique needs of the California Community Colleges. Um, what I'd like to make sure everybody understands is that we're really talking about course design standards, not content. Um, and so we're not intruding on the, on the purview of faculty uh, in terms of how they, how, uh, how they include content or not in a particular course. What we're really trying to help them with are things like navigation. So how can they make that easy and straightforward and consistent so the students can find things easily? What are some of the student engagement strategies that they might employ to help improve uh, retention and success in their online courses? And how can we make sure that those courses are fully accessible to students of, of all ability levels? Uh, and so it's really about the design of the course, not the content of the course. Uh, we've uh, trained a lot of peer faculty uh, reviewers uh, to review these courses with their colleagues uh, who have authored them. Uh, and we also uh, are working with our, fr our friends at At One to provide instructional design and accessibility design support uh, to faculty to address uh, these standards if they have a course reviewed and that course doesn't quite meet the standards. So, Pat or, or Jamie, anything further on course design standards? Um, only that we're currently, well, constantly looking at ways to improve the process. And uh, we hope to have some news on some tools and uh, some revisions to uh, how we can help people coming soon. Uh, currently in the testing process, so we don't want to release anything that's par baked, you know. Perfect. And, and the other pieces, those um, areas in the course design standards are tied to the uh, the courses that are being built to help people learn how to teach online too. Right, right, right. perfect. So, it's, you know, what you'll see is it's very highly integrated into the professional development program that the uh, project has developed. Uh, so speaking of professional development, uh, we've worked very closely with our colleagues uh, at uh, the At One Project. And for those of you who may be familiar with the At One Project, you know that this has been a, a state level uh, a system level initiative that we've that's been around for oh, quite some time, I think probably about 20 years or so. And uh, we uh, said, well, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in terms of professional development. So we've made an investment with our colleagues at At One to have them become the professional development arm of the of the OEI initiative uh, project. So a couple of things that they've done that have been uh, really well received by the field. As I mentioned, they develop course reviewer training uh, that is fully aligned with uh, the, the uh, course design uh, standards rubric. Uh, they bring uh, faculty through that, uh, show them how to apply the, um, uh, uh, the rubric to a course, how to create a report based upon how that course might or might not meet the standards and, and, and really provide the faculty author with some great resources as to what the what they might do to uh, to bring that course up to meet the standards. So uh, that's been, I think we've had, what, how many people have got, an enormous number of people have gone through that training. Um, it's over 300. Yeah, so a huge amount of faculty all over the state and uh, whenever we offer one of those sessions, it fills up like that. Uh, and uh, so we'll continue to offer that on an ongoing basis uh, as long as people are, are finding it useful. Um, we also have a, a, a course in Introduction to Canvas. That's the Common Course Management System platform we selected. And we'll talk more about Canvas in, in detail in a minute. But really, this is about uh, the nuts and bolts of how to operate Canvas, how to, how to set up a course, how to set up uh, exams or assignments or th things of that sort. We also have uh, a program for teaching online with Canvas, and this is more about pedagogy uh, than mechanics. 
Uh, and so uh, for uh, folks that uh, have not taught online before or that want to refresh their skills and, and do it in particular uh, context of, of the Common Course Management System, uh, this is available to them as well. And then finally, we have uh, a professional development course on how to migrate migrate courses from another course management system to Canvas, and uh, that's uh, pr proving to be pretty useful as well. So, Pat, anything further on professional development you want to highlight? No, I was just typing in the chat window that the that course, the Teaching with Online Online with Canvas course, is really called the Online um, Education Standards and Practices course. And even though it's offered in Canvas, it's for anybody who's interested in learning how to teach online. It's going to be. It's right now they're making it modular so that if you get your course reviewed and you find that there's a place on the on the rubric that you're lacking, there's a corresponding module that you can take either self-paced or facilitated that's being built right now. But you'll be able to take that um, to to make sure that your course is aligned to the rubric and and to give you that um, ability to you know to learn more about it. So the in the introduction to Canvas is both. Uh, facilitated and or self-paced so you have the options for both of those i think what what people will find is that the the alignment of the professional development with standards and processes and policies and procedures and products and all of those kinds of things is really exceptionally well done so that people are getting uh very very applicable skills and techniques that they can uh, take right to their class that was the point of starting with the with the rubric for course design was once you have that then you can start building everything else right. um, Based once you know what you need to make it good, then you can build everything else on that, right? Uh, the next big thing that we tackled uh, and has been going very well is uh, In the in the realm of student readiness and one of the things that there's a lot of research out there that shows that uh, a student's readiness to take uh, online classes dramatically affects retention and success. So a lot of students go into an online class not knowing what it's all about, not knowing how it works, uh, with misconceptions about how online courses are, thinking that, oh, I don't have to come to class, it must be easier, all, all kinds of things, not having the right technical skills, uh, things of that sort. And so um, we're trying to uh, really make sure that students are fully prepared uh, for uh, taking online classes and that their expectations are set appropriately. So we've been working with our pilot colleges and the consortium around a couple of things. One is a readiness assessment and we piloted that uh, in, in our pilot pro readiness pilot program and uh, found that we needed to make some adjustments to that. So that uh, assessment is being reworked a bit based on the feedback that we got from the pilot. And that will be the, the, the readiness assessment is will be available to consortium colleges. Um, online, we also developed a, a series of, of really exceptional online readiness tutorials uh, based on the assessment, uh, things to help the students understand what online courses are all about, how to interact with their teacher, uh, how to do time management, a whole variety of things. Uh, based on uh, great input from our faculty colleagues and a whole lot of research and um, you know great great uh, people who were coming together to say I know these are the kinds of questions we get from students all the time so those uh, readiness tutorials have been um, fully developed they are platform agnostic so they can be used in kind of in any portal in any uh, learning management system um, on any website they can be integrated into a, a college's other um, matriculation and orientation materials they're, they're pretty flexible they have a, a pretty they have a basic level of accessibility and we are continuing to work on improving that uh, accessibility to uh, uh, go to the next level but they are they are, have a basic level of accessibility currently they are available to all colleges at no cost uh, so you can uh, use those, and they're exceptionally well integrated with Canvas, our Common Course Management System. So you'll see the, uh, the uh, URL to get to the readiness material if you want to look at those further or consider using them uh, in your uh, particular environment. Uh, online tutoring was one of the next big things that we tackled. Uh, we brought together another uh, work group uh, to help us figure out what 
uh, would be helpful, most helpful for uh, online tutoring. Uh, we went out and uh, did an RFP for an uh, online tutoring system and services, and we selected a product called the Worldwide Whiteboard from Link Systems. Uh, this platform is available to all colleges in the state at no cost, and you can utilize this with any tutors for any kind of class. So it doesn't have to be just online classes. You can use it for online tutoring for face-to-face -face classes or what have you. Uh, you can use it with any kind of tutor you like. So if you've got volunteers on your campus or students uh, or professional tutors or faculty that do tutoring, you, that's up to you. You can use it however you see fit. Uh, through this contract, we also have professional tutors available. Uh, they're available to all the colleges in the state uh, on a statewide contract through the foundation. So we brought the cost of professional tutors way down uh, for everybody in the state. Uh, we do, uh, you could use uh, professional tutors to supplement what you could do with local tutors. So you may need tutors at a, when you don't have local tutors available. So somebody needs tutoring at say two o'clock in the morning. Uh, you can, you can uh, you usually provide a tutor uh, through this method uh, for that. You might need a tutor in a subject where you have no tutors on your campus. And this is another way that you can uh, get uh, people. Or you may have tutors uh, at, at, but in math, but say not at the right level. Uh, so you may have tutor, a lot of tutors in, uh, in algebra, but nobody in calculus. So you can usually find a professional tutor through this uh, contract to meet those needs. Uh, and so again, those are uh, professional tutors are available through the statewide contract to all colleges, but consortium colleges receive a, a subsidy for professional tutors. And again, this is all uh, integrated very nicely with uh, the Canvas platform. Academic integrity is something that uh, many of our faculty colleagues uh, are, are very interested in and, and uh, we've been working with uh, another work group to look at things like proctoring and plagiarism detection. Uh, we put together, put out an RFP um, last year for, uh, for proctoring and plagiarism detection services. Uh, there's some really good solutions out there. We chose a, a company called Proctorio. Uh, this is a, a technology-based, machine-based uh, proctoring system, so it allows you to uh, essentially have an online proctored exam uh, and, you can, and you can send students to that uh, to, to have them take their exam there. It's available to uh, consortium colleges at no cost uh, and available to non-consortium colleges at a greatly reduced cost. And, and off the top of my head, I'm not sure what that cost is. Do you, do you know, happen to know, Pat? I don't, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know what they've negotiated. But, but you couldn't possibly get a better deal outside of OER. So uh, whatever that cost is, it's very affordable. No, uh, we leveraged 113 co uh, colleges. So there you go. we're anxious there you go. to bring that cost down. Yeah. The other thing that faculty have told us is to say, well, um, okay, I understand what mediated proctoring is all about, and that's fine, but I'm not comfortable with that. I really think that the nature of my exam and the content of my discipline, uh, I really need uh, a face-to-face -face proctored exam. And so we are working on developing a proctored network, which would be uh, uh, community college sites throughout the state where uh, students could go, uh, and uh, that might be close to their home but far from their teaching college, and uh, take an on, uh, a proctored exam on site, and we'll develop uh, kind of standard operating procedures so that it's it's easy and simple for uh, our, our college colleagues throughout the state to um, to administer. Uh, so that's being developed uh, right now. And then finally, uh, we're putting out uh, an RFP for plagiarism detection. We had hoped to be able to um, piggyback on a contract that CSU had with uh, one of the primary vendors, but that didn't prove to be as successful as we had hoped. So. Uh, there's some really interesting up-and-coming uh, plagiarism detection systems, and uh, we're taking a very close look at those. And uh, we think that given that we are, again, the largest system of higher education on the planet, that maybe uh, we can influence the direction of one of these newer products to uh, be more responsive to the particular needs of the California community colleges. So that's uh, being worked on, um, and we'll have uh, more information uh, probably later this spring. Online counseling is a big deal for us. Uh, 
uh, we, we need to have the ability to uh, support students and from, from a counseling perspective uh, remotely uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, this is true for students who are taking online courses, but probably also just as true for students uh, that may not be taking online courses but have trouble getting to campus for, online, for, for counseling in the traditional sense. Uh, so again, we brought together a work group who helped us put together some specifications for an online counseling system. We ultimately chose a product called Creating Cafe, which is a, a very robust counseling platform uh, that allows uh, counselors and students to interact and, and uh, share things like transcripts and ed plans and other kinds of documents uh, and, and keep a, a, a a record of that session, really a quite a wonderful product. Uh, we will uh, handle, the OEI project will pay the cost of uh, the setup for all colleges in the state, uh, and then consortium colleges will receive the product at no cost, and the annual cost for non-consortium colleges is a mere $3,750. So it's really quite a bargain. Uh, again, this is uh, bringing the, the ability to leverage the size of our system uh, to uh, the negotiating table helps us uh, bring in uh, prices uh, at this at this low level. Um, our chief our chief student services officer uh, Bonnie Peters is also working to develop a peer network for counselors to help uh, counselors help each other uh, develop online counseling techniques because it is a different kind of uh, interaction and engagement than uh, just sitting in an office with someone and having conversation with them. And so that is currently uh, under developed. And I think Pat wants to add something to that. Yeah, there's also a class that's being written that will be um, an at one course that will be available for counselors to take about counseling students online and particularly counseling online learners. So that's the, they're, they're almost done with that. That should be released pretty soon in the next month or so, or probably next month. Yeah. Far out. Uh, the common course management system. This is the big dog. <laughs> um, you know, we uh, this was a, a, a significant requirement of the uh, of the governor and the legislature and the chancellor's office that we try to bring together our 113 colleges on on a common platform. Uh, so we went through a very significant RFP process. Uh, we had about 70 people participate, mostly faculty, from all over the state. We had 10 students in there with us from all over the state uh, and went through a very elaborate uh, process that started with a, a request for information, uh, then developed specifications for the RFP, uh, narrowed that down to three vendors, did day-long uh, interviews and demo sessions with them uh, in face-to-face -face in Sacramento. And ultimately, we chose uh, the product Canvas from its structure, which is based in Salt Lake City. Uh, that contract was signed in July of 2015, and the adoption rate has just gone through the roof. It's been incredible. Um, you know, we've had a lot of folks ask us, well, why is it essential to have a single platform? Well, um, I think there's a lot of benefits to it, uh, certainly ease of use for students, uh, also probably ease of use for our faculty for that matter, particularly our adjunct faculty that may be teaching at multiple colleges throughout our system. But it also allows us to really leverage a whole variety of resources, uh, including integration with other systems like uh, Banner or Datatel or PeopleSoft and the student information world, or many of the uh, systems that we talked about uh, this afternoon, um, as well as uh, analytics and reporting systems and, and uh, open educational resources and a whole variety of things. So our ability to provide comprehensive support for students and faculty is really enhanced when we're focused on, on a key uh, uh, standardized system. Uh, so uh, but the other thing that's really good about the Canvas contract is that we project that uh, we will be saving the state about 50% of the cost of the learning management system compared to individual colleges and districts entering into their own contract with uh, whatever uh, their uh, provider of choice was at the time. Uh, and right now, uh, the OEI covers the entire cost of uh, Canvas for all of the colleges, subject to available funding. Um, we we uh, are looking at a couple of things. One is uh, the build-out rate. Uh, we had projected a build-out rate 
uh, that was uh, quite a bit slower than what we've experienced, and that's a good problem to have, uh, but it also means that we're gonna be uh, asking the state for some additional funds. And we actually have already begun that process. We met with the Department of Finance uh, at the very end of February, and uh, their response to um, our need for additional funds was extremely positive, and essentially they've asked us to figure out how much we think we need and when we think we need it. Uh, so that's uh, very good news. But as of last Friday, March 18th, we had 64 colleges have formally committed to migrating to Canvas. This is just knocking our socks off. We never expected this kind of adoption rate this fast. Uh, and in addition, we have 13 colleges that have said, well, we think we wanna move, but we're still working through that decision with our local Senate or our local governance process, whatever that may be. But the chances are good that those 13 will probably also come on or make that decision uh, sometime uh, before the end of spring. So uh, by summer, uh, it would not be unreasonable to think that we might have 80 or more of the 113 colleges uh, on board. And it's just been uh, overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and I think lots of people are beginning to really reap the benefits, not just of a great product for their course management system, but all the other integrated services and programs that go along with that to support students and faculty from 24 seven help desk to professional development, to tutoring, proctoring, all that, all that kind of stuff. So it's really been pretty phenomenal. Um, and, and we've been very excited uh, by, by the enthusiasm and the positive reception in the field. Um, the exchange, so we, lots of folks have heard about the, the, the course exchange, or now as we call it, the student exchange, because it's really more about exchanging students than it is courses. So what is this exchange? Well, I think fundamentally, it's an agreement among the consortium colleges about business processes. So how are we all gonna to agree to honor each other's matriculation guidelines? And how are we gonna to come together uh, in a consortial fashion to uh, support students in terms of financial aid? And how are we gonna to come together around course articulation? So if a student is declared Foothill College to be their home college, and they're taking a college at Long Beach, uh, excuse me, a class at Long Beach City College online, how do we make sure that it's easy for that course to get transferred back to Foothill College and count for an appropriate uh, degree requirement uh, at, at, at Foothill? Uh, so it's really about bringing the colleges together to agree that we'll do business with each other in, in a comparable manner. And we've done that with the consortium and memorialized that with a very extensive memorandum of understanding that outlines all of these Things. And, and it went through many, many changes and additions and, and revisions, um, but ultimately all of the colleges have, have signed off on it or are in the process of signing off on it. And we've also gotten written support from the Chancellor's Office that says, yes, the things you have agreed to are allowable by law and regulation, so you may proceed. Uh, so we don't have any problems uh, running afoul of regulation or legislation. Uh, secondly, the exchange is really a technical interface for cross-institutional registration. So again, going back to our original mission of helping students complete their degree in a timely manner, one of the things that we heard a lot from students is, well, I'm at my home college and I'm registering and I've, I want to take five classes and I've got three. Um, and the other two classes I need, I can't get for any number of reasons because my schedule won't allow it, or because um, the sections are all full, or uh, the course is not offered this term, or any, any number of reasons uh, that they're not able to get those courses. So the idea of the course exchange is to provide them with an additional option within the home college registration process to say, can't find what you need? Try the, try the exchange. And they'll be able to look at what courses are being offered online that have a CID number, a, a common course identifier as defined by the state, 
um, and are also applicable to an associate degree for transfer, and that they can see, oh, I see that that course that I need is being offered by Sacramento City College or LA Harbor College or wherever, and that it's, uh, I could take that. So I can now go ahead and register for that course in the context of my home college registration. And a lot of the data exchange and other uh, material that needs to happen to support that student registration across Foothill to Long Beach City College, let's say, has happened in, happens in the background, and what the student then needs to do to complete that registration process is really streamlined. Uh, so it's a technical interface, and this is really a, a pretty groundbreaking piece of work that, uh, to the, our awareness, has not been done by any other state in the country. So we're really excited about that. But the thing to keep in mind is that this is about helping students complete the ADT and transfer. It's not meant to be a way for students to just take all their classes online and get their degree completely and totally online. Certainly, they could do that. Students do do that already, uh, whether they're doing it through the OEI or not. Uh, but uh, this is really focused on degree completion, helping students maintain a full-time load uh, and get access to the courses they need so they can uh, complete and transfer in a timely manner. So we're hoping to begin piloting this very soon from an administrative perspective and then expose it to students in the fall of 2016. We'll be expanding that pilot for the spring of 2017 and we'll be planning further expansion for the summer and fall of 2017. Uh, but uh, again, this is a, a, a complex and intricate piece of work that our colleagues at the uh, Community College Tech Center at Butte are undertaking and uh, we'll have to see, see how it goes. So it's come, but it's coming along very nicely. So what's next for the OEI? Well, uh, we've done a lot, as you can see, uh, but we've also got uh, some other things that we're working on, some of which are being worked on as we speak, but other things are coming up. Uh, but basic skills was a big part of what we were asked to address, not in terms of offering basic skills courses, but offering basic skills to support to students who are in transfer level courses, but needed a skill tune up either in terms of English or math, things of that sort. So we've, uh, Barbara Lowski, uh, one of our uh, uh, esteemed faculty from Foothill College is our Dean of uh, Basic Skills and on Open Educational Resources. And she's really working uh, to help faculty embed basic skills content into transfer courses so that students can continue uh, to close their skill gap as they work on uh, transfer level courses. So that's coming together. Uh, Barbara's also been working with our colleagues on the Common Assessment Initiative, which is developing a new uh, statewide model for uh, uh, math and English placement uh, around pre-assessment preparation for students so they can uh, be as successful as possible on the, on the uh, assessment examinations that uh, will all be standardizing as soon as it's available. Pat, did you have something you want yeah, to Yeah, we have some, Barbara's collected resources for underprepared students that you may find in your online classes as they enroll in classes in, and that don't have prerequisites particularly. And so those references, um, lots of resources you can plug in wherever you want are available on our website. So she's got a list of those and she's actually working on some information about how to get students to use those things. Right. So that's moving, moving along pretty swiftly. Uh, one of the other things we were asked to do was to look at opportunities to streamline the credit for prior learning process. So, uh, and so we are working very carefully with our uh, colleagues in the Statewide Economic Senate. Uh, about two years ago, they produced uh, an extensive white paper uh, in outlining their position on credit for prior learning. Uh, and uh, we're also working with our colleagues in the Chancellor's Office who are looking at credit for prior learning, particularly in reference to uh, military veterans. And some other states throughout the country, particularly Minnesota, have done some exceptionally good work at uh, helping military veterans understand uh, what their training and service might help them accomplish from a, from a, a, a college credit perspective. And we're looking at some of the ways that we might do that as well for veterans in California. Uh, so that's coming together in our Chief Academic Officer, Jory Hatzel, who's working very closely with Pam Walker, the Chief Academic Officer for the system, uh, to look at 
uh, ways that we can do that, especially with some support from uh, recent legislation that uh, focuses on uh, increasing support for veterans. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're continuing to advocate for increased funding, uh, particularly with the unprecedented adoption of Canvas. Uh, I think we're moving our target from uh, hoping that we might get 90 colleges to thinking that it's totally doable, that we could get all 113 colleges on board. Uh, but that's going to cost a little more money, and there's other things that people want to do. Uh, and we're finding that our, the model, the fiscal model that we've developed, uh, where we can provide uh, some level of support to all colleges and other levels of support to colleges that come together and formalize their, their um, uh, involvement with other colleges through the consortium is, is working out pretty well. And so we want to continue to expand that. We want to continue to keep these resources uh, funded centrally. It helps keep the cost down. It helps keep the administrative work down uh, and, and gives us the leverage that we uh, deserve as the largest system of education. Uh, in the uh, in the country and then finally we're looking at ways that we can begin to expand support services for students and faculty uh, beyond the first five years of the project so do we need to look at other kinds of uh, of support services that might include I don't know social media it might include virtual desktop computers it might include a whole variety of things that were not part of the initial scope of the project but now that we've got the initial scope pretty well uh, taken care of we can really begin to look at expanding that scope into other things that faculty and students have identified as important needs for, for online instruction so that's where we're headed in the near future so um, with that, if you have any questions or comments, you've heard any great rumors or terrible lies, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me uh, or contact uh, Pat or uh, Jamie or any of the uh, folks, uh, Jory Hatzel, uh, Bonnie Peters, any of the folks, uh, Barbara Lowski, any of the folks on the, on the project. Uh, you can find all their email in uh, the Foothill De Anza Global Address Book, and uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, if you'd like, if your department would like to hear more specifically about what OEI is doing and how it may be relevant uh, to your department, uh, I'd be happy to come and have that conversation with you, and I'm sure any of the members of the team that are available would have, be happy to be there too. So uh, with that, I'd maybe uh, ask Pat or Jamie if there are any final words from uh, your perspective, and if not, then um, we will adjourn this uh, session of the ETAC Town Hall. No, thank you, Joe, for doing that. You did a great job and just sort of outlining the ton of stuff that we're, that we're doing. Um, please see our website. I just posted in the chat the, um, the URL for the website. It, it's uh, ccconcloned.org. And if you go there, you'll find all of those resources and information um, lots of information pretty readily available there. You can start including those in your teaching right away. Even if you're teaching face to face, there are a lot of things there that you sure. can. Yeah, that, that's, thank you, Pat. That's an important point. You know, a lot of these resources, uh, although the scope of our project is focused on supporting online courses and programs, students and faculty, it's, the, you probably will find a lot of these resources to be very, very useful to all kinds of instruction. And that's one of the big things we've heard from a lot of faculty as they've gone, say, through the course review process. They said, wow, I just really learned a whole lot about my course and about my teaching, and now i got to go back and do this for all the rest of my courses. So it's been uh, very exciting uh, to have that kind of impact on our system. So, Jamie, anything from you, my friend? No, everything's going great. I, I would just take advantage of this chance to thank everyone for their support. I think we're doing things for accessibility that people have dreamed about for a long time, and it's really exciting. Great. Thank you. So with that, uh, again, if you have any questions or need any more information, please don't hesitate to contact us and check ccconcloned.org for updates and other resources. And uh, with that, we will sign off for this afternoon. Thanks again for joining us for the ETAC Town Hall meeting.